technology is like a mirror. If an idiot looks in, you can't expect um, uh, a, an apostle to look out. <laughs> you know, it's it's. I, I remember when I first saw some uh, Photoshop. The very first version of it was called Pixel. In fact, uh, it's a very early version. And I saw some of the things that it could do, and and I couldn't wait to put it on little floppy disks onto my computer. And I and I raised my fingers and then thought, Oh, I don't have any artistic talent. <laughs> What's the point? It's like if you get a great keyboard, but you, you've got nothing to express musically. It doesn't matter how good MIDI is and how many uh, synthesized, sampled uh, instruments you have. It facilitates. It's the great thing about social networking, which uh, at the time we're talking, of course, is, is still growing at what seems an exponential rate, just uh, all the time, the upward curve of it, is that um, everybody has a talent to interact with other people, short of um, being on the autistic spectrum, of course, which is um, something that <laughs> many people are in, in very small ways or in, in greater ways. But e even that can be helped by uh, by the interactions of the internet. And I think forgetting the technology, forgetting what your device can do, forgetting how good the camera is or anything like that, the most successful um, uses you can make of, for example, Twitter or Facebook or any of those social networking type things I I are, are completely down to your personality, are absolutely to do with who you are. I think, particularly in America, though it's, it's common now more across the world, there is this yearning for people to find answers to techniques that will make them happy or rich. In fact, probably in the other, other order, rich and then happy, because of course riches gives happiness, doesn't it? <laughs> well, to me, uh, if, if I had known when I was younger that chasing technique, chasing an answer is fatal. And I would say this, and many people would scream with disbelief, I would say the worst thing you can ever do in life is set yourself goals. I think goal orientation is absolutely disastrous in life. I, two, two things happen. One is you don't meet your goals, so you call yourself a failure. Secondly, you meet your goal and go, well, I'm here, now what? I'm, I'm not happy. I've got this car, this job. That I'm living in this address, which I always thought was the place I wanted to be. And... What? Because you're going for something outside yourself, and that's no good. My, my favourite quotation almost, at least at the moment, is from Noel Coward, who was a very great actor, producer, writer, musician. Uh, he was all round. He was known as the master by everyone who knew him because he was so good at everything. And he said, work is more fun than fun. And if I had known that the the real joy in life is work, and if you can say of the work you do that it's more fun than fun, then you're in the right place. Most of us, of course, don't have that all the time, but every time you look in the bathroom mirror in the morning, if you can say, is my work more fun than fun, or is it, is it treading water, is it just getting me to a wage packet that allows me to go to bars and buy things, and if that's it, then that's a bit of a treadmill, I think. And everyone has it in them to express themselves, that fundamental thing that they know they are inside, that rather beautiful, afraid person, which might get translated into aggression or silence or shyness or all kinds of other things. But inside, we know we are huggable and lovable and we want to love and be loved. That person is yearning for fulfillment, to, to, to be the person that they, they know they can be. And and that's a constant journey, it's a process. It's not about acquiring this thing and then that thing, getting to this place, learning this technique, finding out how this works. It's about, I suppose to me, it's about the fact that other people are always more interesting than oneself. And if, if there is a thing, let's forget what successful people have in common. If there is a thing that unsuccessful people have in common, it's that they, they talk about themselves all the time. I need to do this, I need, you know, the first two words are usually I need. And that's, that's why nobody likes them, and that's why they'll never get where they want to be. Because it's I need this, and I, don't, I, 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 my, I, my, I, 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 there's an English word for that, egocentric, or egoistical, or egotistical. They're all the words from ego, the Latin for I. And if you just say I all the time, you get nowhere. 
if you're interested in other people, if you use your eyes to look out, not to be looked into, uh, and then you, then you connect and then you're interesting and then people want to be around you. And it's about the warmth and the charm you can radiate that is real because of your positive interest in others. And if you expect it to come to you and go, I or I never had this or I was, you know, you hear people, I, you know, I happen to love, and I know a lot of people don't, but I happen to love the works of William Shakespeare, the, the, the poet and playwright. I think they are amongst the greatest things that humanity has ever done up there with the pyramids or whatever it is you want to choose. The number of times you hear people say, oh, it was ruined for me at school. And I, I tend to say to them, yeah, I don't really like the Grand Canyon or the Lake District or the mountains of Scotland because I had a really bad geography teacher, so I don't find them very beautiful. I mean, it's just nonsensical. You, you, you just, it, it's a sign of people stopping back and blaming something else rather than just saying, oh, I wasn't ready for it then and maybe I never will be, but I'm not going to blame someone else for it. It's, it's, it's that attitude of looking inwards. And American television is filled with people sitting in chairs on these sort of afternoon talk shows, going, I need whining, whining about their lives. So I'm beautiful, I'm lovely, and yet nobody, you know, I'm special, I have need, oh, shut up. Stop whining. Like, just grow up and get a life and look around you at other people and don't expect people to care. Don't expect people to be interested. Who, who do you feel more sorry for? Who do you actually want to hug? The person you happen to know has a tumour and is just getting through life not talking about it, smiling, trying not to embarrass anybody about it. Or the kind of person who's always going, oh, my leg, that, ha that, that went there, and then I had this pain here and the doctor didn't know what to do about it, and I get these flushes, and he oh Christ, I'm sure it's terrible for you dear, but shut up. You know, you just don't... Now, of course we do our best and we feel sorry for all kinds of people and we, you know, show sympathy, but the real heroism of people who quietly get on with their lives and think of others should be rewarded and usually is by the fact that they are liked and if you're liked people want to be with you and if people want to be with you they share opportunities with you and you observe the way they do things and your life can open up and, and there are opportunities everywhere whether you're in a small town or in a, in a tiny apartment in a huge city there are opportunities you know you can simply by talking more to the person in, 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 the, in the coffee shop, in the coffee store, you know, in, in your Starbucks or whatever, simply by just having a few extra words. You don't, you don't, they're, they're probably doing a concert somewhere in a, in a little bar uh, in the evening and, and, the, and you might go along and you meet them and you meet someone else and you might, you might, who knows, that's how some people become managers of musicians. They go out and they find talent and they look at it, other people. So that really to me is, if, the, if life has any secret, it's, it's, it's abnegation of self, efface yourself, don't talk, just don't say, if you kept yourself saying me or I too often, you're on the wrong track. I think, I think it's very, in the same way that turning in on yourself is a very d negative and sort of it's destructive to finding opportunity, simply staying in the same place um, and knowing what you know all the time. I, I once wanted to um, uh, open a restaurant where you, uh, you always got the, 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 the dish that the person next to you ordered because that's always the one you wish you had. And I also thought like, you know those things like Netflix and, uh, and that, that they should send you um, a DVD that is the exact opposite of the kind that you like. That's the way you learn. So Amazon said, uh, I see you liked um, this, n this novel by this novelist, why not try this? And then you say, but that's complete. Yes, that's the point. It's completely different. It's not your usual thing. You know how we always buy, you know how partners always say to you, why are you buying that shirt? Well, you've got one exactly like it. And you say, it's not exactly like it. It's got a slightly different color. And we're like that in life. We, we tend to settle so quickly. And the best way to stop that to, to keep reinventing oneself and make life to invention, I think is tra travel is a fantastic way and it's never been easier. There, there are ways now I think uh, a lot of us try to be responsible in our travel because of course, uh, you know, what we do to the environment by traveling, but there are ways of sharing travel, traveling with other people, especially amongst the young. They, they travel around the world, they share books. There's this thing that I, I only discovered a few years ago that is very common in the places where young people travel a lot, like say the Inca Trail in Peru or in the, the, the Southeast Asia, you know. Um, pe people just leave a book and they leave their name on it and a little note. They just leave it in a public place, anywhere. 
and someone picks it up and goes, oh, that's good, and they read the last note, they read it, and then they leave it. And uh, uh, these books have a magical history of going around. Um, and it's travel and, and reading are, you know, to me, such extraordinary pleasures um, that I, I couldn't p conceive of life without them. And, and they, they constantly teach you. They don't just teach you about the rest of the world, they teach you about your, where you come from. There's a saying, I think it was Kipling said, about England, where he came from, so what, what do they of England know that only England know? I, what do you know about your own country if your own country is the only country you know? You don't know America unless you've travelled outside and you see, then you think, oh, gosh, we do things differently. I didn't know. I thought the way we did this was so natural and normal, but they do it completely differently. You learn so much about your own country by travelling. Also, I think, to me, the people I've always admired most have had heroes, uh, are, are sort of shameless about the fact that you admire other people. If, if, there is, if there's a phrase that makes my heart sink, it's not impressed. You know, people who just say, yeah, I saw it, not impressed. You know, as if, well, who cares whether you're impressed? It's such a, you know, it's such a vain thing to say, as if your standards are so high that, you know, you need to be impressed. To impress me, you've got to be damn good. I mean, there are things we don't like, there are things we think are substandard or, you know, ordinary, which we can turn away from. But it, it's wonderful to rush headlong at something with enthusiasm, like a puppy, um, for things you admire and people you admire. Sometimes they'll disappoint you, you know, some, some great singer or some fabulous painter or, or writer may turn out to have had a pretty horrifying private life or to do unpleasant things to animals or whatever, but, but, but to, to admire is enormously helpful. I think, because it's a, one of the most natural things, and mentoring is of course at the, at, at the heart of this, one of those natural things is to sit at the feet of a master. Uh, and to learn, you know, you see it in all cultures. In, in Eastern cultures, you have a very particular image of the, you know, like uh, Kung Fu or something, you know, with Grasshopper sitting at the feet of his, his Shaolin priest, teaching him so many things about um, mind and spirit and body and so on. But also, I, you know, if you wish to, everyone knows if you wish to learn, say, the guitar, it's not exactly a master then, it's usually a friend. They hand it to you and they go, no, put your finger like that, you know, play that, and then just play that in that rhythm and then. And then when it's time for the change, it's that one, yeah? And then, and you can, wow, and say, oh, I found a new chord today, look at this. But I go, oh, that's really good. And then slowly you've, you're learning the guitar. And then the time may come when you, you know enough chords, actually to get a book or, to, or a video or, 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 or to take proper lessons if you wanted to proper lessons in that way. But you're learning with friends, you're showing each other, you're learning together. And that's really what education is. To me, if I go back to my, I was lucky enough to go to university and uh, there were some splendid professors there, magnificent, you know, world-renowned people. Um, and they were charming to talk to and they knew a lot of things. But all the learning I really did was sitting with coffee in, 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 in your rooms with, with friends talking about everything, you know, the cosmos and God and Marxism and history and, uh, and, and psychology and truth and, and lies and honesty and all the things that seem very pretentious later on and seem a bit over earnest perhaps. But you make these journeys with your friends, you, you, you learn off each other, you, you, you take pleasure like saying, have you seen this new chord and some new idea that you've picked up. And so again, you know, learning is all about other people. It's not about yourself with your head in a book. I mean, there are things you can learn, of course, from, you know, dummies guides and, uh, and, and serious uh, instructional works. But I don't think many people I know who've mastered anything have done so from, from that. They've done it through their interaction with others. I, I would say that Probably one of the most wonderful things you can be given in life is the ability to give. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes, because I've, I've had a lucky life and you know, I have an opportunity to, to, to give something or whatever, um, at a time or money or, or, or whatever it might be, or, or a presentation or a speech or something, and people say, oh, oh gosh, it's so kind, and I said, well, which would you rather be? Would you rather be someone who asked for help or money or would you rather be someone who's in a position to give it? It's so obvious which it is. No one wants to ask. Everyone wants to give. And it astonishes me when, when I do meet people in my profession who, who are closed to turning up to anything. I mean, I can understand why people wish to guard their privacy and, and they don't have to turn on every, every red carpet just because it's a charity event. Or the, but there are so many ways you can use 
um, any accumulated wealth or, or reputation or, or influence you may or may not have that, that are helpful for other people. And it's just the most natural and wonderful thing to pass it on. I'm, almost everything I do, I sort of aim at my 14, 15 year old self. I had a very troubled childhood and it ended up with me going to prison. Um, and, and I still want to talk to that young me. I still want to, you know, do things for him. This is the book I would like him to have re read when he was 16 sort of thing I, I write, you know. And um, not that I hope that my, I, my books are, 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 are preachy or teachy, but um, I, I just, I think sharing the, the benefits of life is, is the benefit of life, oddly enough. <laughs> I think probably everybody watching me now has more power in any real sense um, in which power matters than, say, Louis the Fourteenth or Napoleon. Um, we don't have power of life over death, uh, which is probably one we don't want, so that's, that's quite good. But in, just in terms of when Napoleon had wanted to know something, he would have to send people out to Egypt to bring back a, a stone or something, and, and, and scholars would gather and talk about it. And, if he, and similarly, if he wanted the spice, if ships go away and come back, we can go into stores on the corner of the street that where the bounty of all five continents is heaped up in ways that has never been known. We have access to everything and most importantly to information, to knowledge. Um, <clears throat> but is it knowledge and where does it come from? How can we trust it? Um, and is knowledge the same thing as truth? Is knowing that the Spanish Armada attacked Britain in 1588 actually knowledge or is it just simply in today's technology terms, a sort of piece of metadata that's just flagged in history. It's really no more than that. Without knowing what that means, 1588 Armada, it's pointless, or 1776, or whatever date you choose. And for me, I think the, the history of the world that has arrived at this point where I can speak and it can be watched by people in all kinds of ways and all kinds of devices and can stay for eternity resting on servers and who knows where the whole thing of this time it all comes from inquiry it all comes from open inquiry and the word really is em empiricism which is a strange word but what it means is testing things you, you don't take anything on trust you test it out if a book says this is you know you shall have um, you know, you shall have no foreskin or you must not eat shellfish. You can choose to say this is the word of a divine being, if you like. It doesn't really get you very much further forward, but it can connect you to your history and your people. And it's, I, you know, I'm not here to disrespect that. Those happen to be laws that are from my people, as it happens. And I don't, uh, a bit, well, the first one I had no choice on, but I, I eat seafood, uh, I eat oysters or whatever. But, um, but for the rest, I, I, I need to know why, why someone is telling me what is the case. Uh, I need to question it and to test it. It needs Authority comes from, from uh, the validity of information, being, being repeatable, being open, being free, and not coming from any, but not coming with a threat, uh, and not, not, not being just told, this is the case and you must believe it, or you die which is, as we know, probably the biggest problem facing the world, the people who say things like that. And uh, unfortunately, it's the young that they appeal to. You, you're unlikely to find the 50-year-old being converted to a fundamentalist belief in something which means that they think people should die for not believing the right thing or for using casual language about their divinity or, or whatever. You won't find a 50-year-old who, you may find one who's grown up like that. We won't persuade a 50-year-old. Like they just know the world too well and go, come on. But unfortunately, an 18-year-old who's lost or feels the world is unjust and, you know, he's right. It is unjust. The world is, might be better if we were all ordered and we all behaved. It might be. <laughs> but we know that, you know, ordered is a dangerous word. <laughs> and that the, the riotous, chaotic freedom we enjoy, which causes so much of a headache for all of us, is infinitely better than the, the rigidity of, of ty tyranny and, and control. And, and religious fundamentalism is just another kind of fascism. It's another kind of communism. It's an extreme dictatorial way of telling people how to behave. And giving, there's, my power comes from a book, whether it's Karl Marx or this holy text. Or, or, uh, and that's, to, to me, the dangerous thing. The truth is woolly and complicated and difficult and oh, but an, oh, maybe it's an oh. <gasps> 
I trust people, you know, the great, you know, one of the wisest heads who ever lived on this planet was, was a, a, a philosopher called Socrates, and he's, he was famous for asking questions. He never gave answers. But the questions are so, were so acute, the, the innocence of a, of a Socratic question. I wonder what we mean by that. You know, and, and even down to, you know, ethics. You know, what age is it, is it, might it be right ever to abort a fetus, and at what age? If you did it on the Wednesday, it would be child killing. If it's on the Tuesday before, it's okay. How can that be? You know, these things are very complicated. And never stop thinking like that. Never stop being a child who says, why? Can that be right? There was a Zeno, one of my favorite philosophers, um, had a pupil next to him and he gave him a bean and uh, put it on the table in front of him and said, is that a heap? And the people said, no. He said, we added another one. He said, is that a heap? People said, no. <laughs> he kept adding them. Eventually people said, that's a heap. He said, oh, we said, oh, a heap is 17. Is it? I take this away, it's not a heap anymore. Is a heap 17? And he was making that exact point. Uh, oh, I see, so this number of days is a life, take one away, it's just a mass of chemicals, you know. And, and life is full of these complexities, like age of consent is, is a similar one, you know. The police enter a room and uh, there's a couple making love, and the, the police enter a room, there's a couple making love, and if they'd entered the day before, it would have been statutory rape. But because it was the day after the birthday, it wasn't. Now, that's, it's such a peculiar way to order a society like that. Um, and uh, I think that sort of the, the flexibility of being able to, to think openly about all kinds of problems uh, is really important for, for one's happiness and for one's sense of self and, and connection with other people. I, I think um, one of the interesting things about social networking is what it's doing to democracy and how it is reactivating many sides of democracy that uh, um, both internationally when there is um, you know it, it's not necessarily changing the world in one in one fell swoop but I think politicians have to be so much more careful now because what they say is not just in the hands of journalists who after all trade favors with them and maybe we'll let this one off for saying this or, but the, that we're all citizen journalists to some extent by blogging and microblogging which is what twi Twitter is um, and I think it allows us to engage more in politics and I think young people although of course there is still the same level of cynicism which is a perfectly justified level to some extent you could call it realism more than cynicism uh, of understanding that, you know they're human beings uh, uh, in these positions of power and you can take a silly you know uh, sort of conspiracy theory view be paranoid about it and think that they're all but actually we know because we were at school with some people who are now, you know, politicians, minor politicians, people my age are running the country. And uh, we know how stupid they are. <laughs> we know how stupid we are. The, and the idea that they're clever enough to conspire in some brilliant way to, you know, with heads of business to make, you know, keep secrets. They can't keep what they do in their trousers a secret. The idea that they can keep anything serious a secret is absurd. Um, and I think, though, they have, they have to be so much more honest now, openness. I think if there's one thing that, that can really transform our lives, it is, it is increasing levels of openness. It is uh, really allowing a transparency in the way people behave and, and transact uh, in business and in politics um, at, at all levels. Uh, and I, I think that's all to the good, I really do. And I think the fact that it's harder to be private is something, of course, that we juggle all the time. If, if, if all this openness is around, it's like we're all living in, in glass houses with no curtains and um, maybe people feel a bit exposed by, by, by participating in the, in the openness of the world. But in, in 10 years' time, almost everything we do will be so locked into el electronic systems. I mean, it already is to a huge extent, but even more so. I mean, just. Uh, including the way we vote and, and so much information will be known about us and we have to just make sure and I think that's the beauty of the internet because there are lots of guardians for us out there who, who do make a fuss when uh, when liberty is threatened. The world is full and, and the history of the world is full of stories of people who um, people who feel out of place in some way but either in their family or in their community that they they just feel they, that the, the stalk dropped them down the wrong chimney um, and that, it, I mean, a, a very common one like, like me is I'm gay, so when, when, especially when I was growing up it was pretty difficult to be open about being gay. There were very few people in the public life, in fact none really, who were openly 
gay, but they were some who were openly camp, and it was a sort of open secret, but that's not what being gay is about. It's, you know, flouncing around in purple dresses isn't exactly <laughs> the whole gay experience. Um, but also, there are there are there may be people who who are born football player who who grow up in a family of musicians and ballet dancers you know and who just want to you know it's not all just bright sensitive artistic people uh, throttled by the commonplace philistinism of their parents it can be quite the reverse you can just want to be ordinary decent you know citizen who plays sport and and uh, isn't interested in all the things that your your parents are and you feel kind of like trapped most of us feel different. I think in teenage in particular, but, but almost all th th throughout life for certain people, there is this tension. On, on the one hand, you want to belong. You, you, you want to be a part of the tribe. You, you, you want to be you know, enclosed in a community and feel the friendship and all the, all the, the fellowship of, 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 of being connected. And another part of one wants to stand alone and be an individual who is utterly different from everyone else. They're the tribe, they're the, the, the muddy Philistines and I'm the artistic sensitive soul. So you want to be a part of the tribe and you want to be a part from the tribe. And it's that pull that I think gives an enormous creative tension that allows people, they're, they're kind of, it's that spark of electricity, if you like, that makes people creative. It's their desire to be absolutely unique but also their desire to belong, that sense of, so they understand other people and what it is to be part of the community, but they also understand the, the sense of the status of an alien and an, an alien and an outsider. And youth, youth cultures that old people stupidly mock, because they say, oh, you're trying to be different, but you all dress the same. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Don't, you just don't get it. That's, you know, that's not the point. This, it really, they, you really do hear adults say that and think they're being clever. Huh. <laughs> you all have the same rings and gothic whatevers, and now you say you just want to be different? Well, you're not. You know. No, it's not. You're, that's what they're doing. Is what I'm describing is they're they're, they're belonging, but they're outside, and and it's it's that paradox, if you like, or, or that counter sort of that con that contraflow, if you like, that I think makes life exciting and gives the the, the rosin that our ballet shoes can grip the stage with if you like. That's a strange metaphor. I don't know where that came from, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I think a very good point about technology is, yes, it connects you to people who may be as rare as you are. It gives you a, a connection. It used to be, for example, that if you liked a particular writer or a particular comic, you would have to go to the nearest big town where there may be one specialist store where you would hang around for, you know, fat comic book guy would come out, what are you people doing? And you would be saying, how much is that comic? And then, you know, and uh, you would meet other collectors, but then you'd have to go 30 miles out, out of town back home to your smaller town and you'd feel disconnected. Now, of course, you're constantly locked in with conversations and uh, uh, and so on with with your fellow collectors uh, and it can go down to the minutest form of of special specialization but there could still be 300 people on the planet who who who's, who who have that and they can now all connect with each other which is must be very exciting on the other hand um, I suppose if you've grown up with the internet as we now have of course people in their 20s who've known nothing but the World Wide Web, uh, which is almost 20 years old. I mean, uh, so uh, that's a, a heck of a thought, isn't it? And uh, maybe they're not so surprised. They just regard it as natural that human beings who have fellow interests connect. And that's a miracle. It's a wonderful thing. Of course, you know, yes, against that, there's the privacy issue and everything else. But I think as long as. I mean, there are dark sides to the internet, obviously. I mean, it's not just the. the, the the, the manifest ones to do with um, you know terrible pornography or whatever, but um, those real problems that come back to the personality disorders, if you like, of those who are obsessed with self. I don't. If I see a YouTube film or or read a blog, I, I don't let my eyes go below to the bottom half of the screen because I get so fantastically upset by people who write comments. I don't, I don't actually know anybody who writes comments, and I think that's the point. The kind of people who put comments are themselves so 
weird and unhappy and alone and strange trolling it's called you know when you read you know vicious comments about things uh, I mean really weird sort of thing either politically weird or religiously weird or just so intolerant or so desperate to be heard so offensive just please you know please listen to me they're saying all the time listen to me and of course you don't want to or if you do you just get so upset you might even be tricked into replying with an aggressive reply to some idiot and their, their vile opinions about things, which they will use on, on completely, you know, it might just be a little thing of a puppy rolling around on, the, you know, some random YouTube thing, and they've just somehow managed to get a thread of nastiness in, in, into it. And they just want to be heard, and they are so resentful, and they're so annoyed, and especially they do it on other people's blogs, because the fact that someone is reading somebody else's blog and not theirs is maddening enough, and they may have liked something they hate. So, I mean, this even happens in technology. If you write so, something like, uh, you know, oh, I saw on my iPhone the other day, and they go, oh, you've got an iPhone, and they just get like two pages of anti Apple madness. You talk about get a life. But that's, you know, th that all comes down to the same problem these self obsessed people. And because they're self obsessed, they just build up these poisons, build up inside them, and they have to get out. Maybe it's better they get out in comment pages on the internet than in violence on the streets, but it's still distressing for us all to see. I suppose the thing I most would like to have known or be reassured about is that in the world the, what counts more than talent, what counts more than energy or concentration or commitment or anything else is kindness. And the more in the world you encounter kindness and cheerfulness, which is its kind of amiable uncle or aunt, um, the more, the, the more, just the better the world always is. And all the big words, virtue, justice, truth, um, are dwarfed by the greatness of kindness.